Neil, I love immersing myself in the science religion wars. <laughs> and one of the issues you deal with is the different methodologies of thinking that both sides do. Uh, you've studied Kabbalah, the Jewish mysticism, and you're a world-class scientist. H how do you compare the ways of thinking of both of them, and is this even a legitimate subject for, for uh, investigation? Well, number one, I don't think there are any uh, subjects for investigation that aren't legitimate. <laughs> legitimate. Um, any question you can think of is worth asking. You might not find the answer, but that's, you know, so that's number one. For the longest time, I didn't think there was any point in trying to attempt a dialogue between uh, earlier in my life, Jewish mysticism and science. Uh, later in life, as I became a Zen Buddhist student, between those two things. That wasn't really a question that interested me. Um, it was a point of tension when I was younger. I had orthodox relatives who were trying to get me to be more orthodox, and part of my instinct was to, in fact, do that. But then they would throw this fundamentalist stuff at me about the seven days of creation, and the world's only 5,000 years old, and then what do I do with evolution? And I remember telling one of my cousins, who was sort of pushing this at me, that um, this didn't concern me. I just kept these two things in two separate boxes in my head, and they had no relationship. And I was very definitive about that. Part of it was to just get her to leave me alone. Um, part of it was because I couldn't see a way to bridge them. And I was afraid there would be a conflict. And I didn't want to deal with there being a conflict. So I just left it. And I'm a Gemini. So, you know, okay, I think about it one way, I think about it the other way. Now, when I think about mysticisms, these are not intellectual exercises. When you read about it academically, it may seem like some guy in the Middle Ages sitting in a room came up with a fanciful idea about how to describe creation. Um, so what's the Kabbalah? Give, give me yeah, an example. So, uh, the, the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, there are many different forms of it, but a, a dominant form, the central question is, how did God create the world? How is the world created in every single moment? Different contemplative practices, different mystical traditions are asking different questions. Buddhism doesn't ask, where does the world come from? Buddhism asks, how is the world behaving? Um, but in Judaism, a central question, uh, Bereshit, in the beginning of God's creating the earth and the heavens, etc. That's a question. How does that happen? And so you have these really beautiful poetic descriptions of things like... Um, there's something called Four Worlds Kabbalah that came out of Lurianic Kabbalah, which was uh, the 15th to 16th century in northern Israel. Um, many of them having been Spanish, and they were thrown out during the Spanish Inquisition, and they wound up there. So tragedy led to this great creative flourishing in this new place. So what they described is there are four levels to the world. Um, there's... Uh, the, the level of atzilut, which is Hebrew for emanation. There's bria, yitzira. I always forget whether they go the <laughs> one direction or the other. Um, and then formation and creation. And then asiyah, the level of doing, this world as we experience it. And it's often described as nested boxes. That's a diagram or worlds that are stacked on top of each other. It's very much the way Asian traditions describe the body as different kinds of bodies as though they're Russian dolls. Well, that's not what the world looks like. So what does that mean? Um, what I've come to understand, mostly through my Buddhist practice and then going back and revisiting these texts, is that the, the mystics were not coming up with poetic descriptions out of their head or even re reading biblical text, because this is not in the biblical no, text. They were having deep experiences of the nature of the universe and in Jewish mysticism of how the world is emerging at every moment. They were experiencing this. They didn't have mathematics to describe it. They didn't have theories like complexity theory to sort of give coherence to it. All they had was a need to describe for themselves and to teach others what they were experiencing. So they used what they had at hand, which was their language. And often the language is poetic because these things are very hard to describe. The surprising thing to me, because I was not looking for this and would not have thought it likely, is that when you think of the universe as a self-organizing system, you have the vacuum that's empty. 
but not totally empty. There's energy down there, and it will pop into virtual particles that will, um, most of which will self-annihilate the quantum foam, but some of them will stay in existence, and then they start to interact, and they will create bigger subatomic particles. And then those will interact eventually to make atoms, which interact to make molecules, which interact to make planets and bodies and galaxies and the whole universe as we know it at this level of scale. Wow. The quantum foam is kind of emanating from the void, isn't it? Atzilut is a really good word for that. And what's below Atzilut in Jewish mysticism is the Ein Sof. That's the infinite God that's beyond description. You can't, it's beyond dualisms. It's beyond words. It's beyond mathematics. Gee, kind of like the physical void the physicists talk about. And then that emanates out of nothing, seemingly, these particles. And then they form into larger particles. And then those create, I always get them backwards, <laughs> one way or the other. They will self-assemble into larger scale structures and those self-assemble into Asiya, where we see the making, the doing of the world as it is. Is that an accident? I don't know that it's an accident, that it lines up so well. Were the mystics through contemplating the world through their mind, actually having a direct experience of what we're arriving at through extending our senses outward? First, magnifying them with microscopes and telescopes. Now we use particle accelerators, but these are all just ways of expanding what our sense organs can perceive to gather data for our minds to assemble into theory and then to test. I mean, a simple explanation is that they were pre-scientific and just thinking of a logical structure and embellishing it with poetry and, and mythology and, and vision. And really, there's no deep, uh, result other than an artistic one. Sure, but number one, an artistic result that's pretty is pretty good. I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't want to read it back into that some deep connection with the fundamentals of, of reality when they had, they had none of that. Except it's such an extraordinary coincidence. Is, is it, though? That's the question. Is it a coincidence, well, or is it just some obvious thing that that's the way you, you develop things, and, and you're reading back with the, the scientific approach today and reading into it something that's not there? That's possible. But there are a couple of issues with that. Number one, what is the likelihood that randomly coming up with a beautiful image, they would come up with an image that is such a good poetic description of this, and... It wasn't just the Kabbalists. In Hindu mysticism, they have an almost identical system because their question there too is, how is the world created? How is it created in each moment? And the same sort of stuff happens. Um, Buddhism asks different questions, but if you apply the principles of complexity theory to describe how the universe self-organizes from the quantum foam on up, what you wind up with is a perfect mathematical description of the Buddhist principles of emptiness of inherent existence, impermanence, interdependence of all beings, karmic law, cause and effect. Wow, that's an awful big series of coincidences. Again, my question has never been, can the science explain the mysticism? Can the mysticism explain the science? I always kept them separate. The surprise to me, and it's a very big surprise, not one I'm always in terribly comfortable with, though I'm becoming more comfortable, is they line up really well. And then one has to ask, can you explore the world by looking inward in contemplative practice the way we look outward to explore the world? And my own personal experience of mysticism, of meditation, um, is that in fact, yeah, that's possible, that there are insights into the nature of reality obtainable through the mind looking inward. Can I convince you of that? Maybe if I teach you to meditate and you sit down for five years, maybe that'll, you know, 